There it is. Wow, there we go. You got it. Okay. <laughs> Are you coming to us from sunny, uh, from sunny LA, I guess? Right? Hunting Beach, to be precise. But Hunt well, sunny, but freaking cold right now. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, I moved from Germany to LA all the way to find out that my parents currently have better weather than I have. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it weird? This is a weird. Yeah, it's crazy. We had. Uh, um, yeah, it's been freaking cold the last day, like like forty or something during the night. So that's not very typical for the area. Yeah. Yeah. So fingers weird. fingers crossed. Two more weeks or something like that, and then we should be back to normal. Cool. Well, I actually got to visit Germany last year for the first time, and it was nice. Yeah, went to uh, Berlin. Went to um, let's see, <laughs> I don't remember the names. We were at, I stayed with a friend near the Air Force bases down in Lonsdul. Uh huh. Okay. Frankfurt and a couple other cities. We went over to Luxembourg, Strasbourg. Anyway, a lot of bergs. <laughs> quite a nice tour it was amazing yeah well hey thank you so much for joining us uh this is amazing we're gonna just quick housekeeping rules everybody just keep yourself muted unless you have a question but um you don't have to raise your hand if you if there's an entrance just jump in and say ask a question uh dirk if you're okay i'm gonna ask kind of start you off with some questions um sure. we're gonna record this just so i let him answer <laughs> <laughs> what's his name uh linus Linus like the like peanuts. Yeah, pretty much, but that is kind of more more of a coincidence. So that was not intentional. I kind oh. of later realized, well, that's peanuts actually, but well, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. He always uh, takes the first row. <laughs> <laughs> is he pretty is he pretty needy? Does he need his daddy all day? Yeah, yeah. Especially when daddy is calling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, so tell us, the, um, the students in here are students of the Triple Threat Artist. It's an online producing course, and, and we work on just upping our, our chops in, in production, uh, mainly with, with music that um, is going to be pitched to film and TV for the, uh, but like songs with full songs. So lyrics, melody, chords, that kind of thing. And most of the people in here are artists, and they put out their own music, and they're incredibly talented and up and comers and um, we're all kind of helping each other out to, to build each other up, motivate each other, share information, that kind of thing. Uh, but I have been kind of producing on my own for last, gosh, um, I guess since about 2001. So coming up on 20 years and absolutely love it. But there's things I'm trying to help them with so they don't have to learn the hard way like I did, you know? <laughs> yeah. So first of all, hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's out there. Thanks. And uh, I have kind of been following you for a while. I think you had uh, done a, a demo. You had done a lot of demos for different um, virtual instrument libraries. Yeah, that happened over time. <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of found you through SoundCloud and started following you and was just enthralled by a couple, couple songs you did that were just epic. And I... I have listened to him a thousand times going, how did he do that? That is incredible. I mean, it sounds like a full orchestra. It sounds like it's just phenomenal. So I'm a big fan of your work. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got into music, how you got into what you do and what you do? Okay. I tried to keep that brief. Okay. Um, overall, for the majority, I'm self-taught. So I uh, didn't go the classic route. Um, started off in school with uh, the usual stuff school band uh covering green theater <laughs> <laughs> so not just the usual stuff so we uh, we were pretty demanding to ourselves and uh i took the keyboard part in the hat and uh yeah i did a bunch of gigs then i joined a pop choir uh gospel stuff and things like that and uh, took some singing lessons at that time uh Moving on a little bit forward, uh, 2001, I actually started to study music at University of Potsdam. Mm. Um, actually wanted to become a teacher, like for English and music, and uh, never finished it. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so after quite a while, uh, then I got away from music a little bit. I did uh, freelancing web design, uh, kind of also self-talk, just got myself into it uh, back then. There was a high demand. <laughs> we didn't have the tools we have today. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, um, and in 2007, 2008, I met uh, with a friend of mine. Actually, he was my boss because uh, I started to work in that company as an in-house web designer. Mm -hmm. And he was a guitarist and we kind of got along pretty well with each other. And uh, we decided, okay, let's do some music. And we founded Ansorica, which was my uh, first serious band project, so to say. So that was um, pretty much uh, summed up symphonic metal. So, and that forced me to go into orchestral arranging and actually doing some orchestral stuff because that's what the music called for. And I just love Nightwish and with Invitation and all that stuff. And then all these big epic sounds combined with guitars these soundscapes and uh, started off with East West composer, not composer cloud, uh, the, the East West orchestra. Mm -hmm. So not the Hollywood orchestra, but the old one. Okay. Uh, that was, that was huge, wasn't it? it? It was huge. Back at the time, it was just uh, amazing to have all the stuff at your hands and at your fingertips and, and work with it. And yeah, we did our debut album rise in 2008 and it got pretty successful in Europe. And as it oftentimes is with these like newcomer bands, shortly after the debut album all fell apart. <laughs> we didn't do anything more there. And also the job didn't work out anymore at the company and I got back to freelancing and my son was born. And um, the first thing was to ask myself, what are we actually going to do now? So I didn't finish my university, so I didn't have any kind of paperwork in my hands to what I'm actually going to do and i got back to freelancing web design and say okay give it one last kick and try to bring music on board for whatever way you you're gonna go with it that was was 2011 and uh i actually started out an audio jungle i remember so audio. i found found this platform to to sell your stuff and back then it was hilarious they kind of sold the stuff for 14 bucks a track uh -huh. But I still remember like that was uh, beginning of April 2011 when I had uploaded the first like 10 tracks or something when I sold my first license and I still remember this when when that kind of rang a bell that somebody is willing to pay $14 for a track to use in a production whatever YouTube video I have no idea where it ended up but the fact that uh, somebody was willing to pay more than one dollar in the iTunes store, you know, to, to use a track for a production. I was a total noob, total no idea of how the business works and things like that. And back at the time um, was when in Germany, Facebook came up and, and was more popular. Mm -hmm. And I kind of um, followed my gut feeling there and saw Facebook as a, not only as a procrastination thing, but also as a tool to actually work with it. And I started networking and got in touch with people and joined groups and uh, just talked to other composers. And uh, sooner than later, I got in touch with, uh, for example, Russell Bell from, from England. He introduced me to a library he was writing for in New York and I started working for them. Uh, had placement with America's Next Top Model and all these reality shows. Um, Did you do uh, uh, Project Runway? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that as well. I'm a huge fan of Project Runway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, guilty not pleasure. Before the show, I just wrote for the for the catalog, and and Music Soups ended up using my stuff for for the show, so that was nice. That's a very and um, then uh, it just went pretty straight onward from there. I got in touch with a few people from uh, from the trailer music business in mm -hmm. Los Angeles and started in 2012 i started working with those brains whom i still work with so uh that was my first trailer label that i signed with and back then i signed exclusively with them uh which just opened more possibilities for me to actually pay the rent and things like that and uh grow with their feedback and then do more stuff music uh in, in terms of music and um from then it just was a it was bumpy right you can honestly say that but i've been doing that for nearly eight years now so uh something must have worked out 
<laughs> Absolutely. So does most of your music all then go into like production libraries that gets licensed from there? Or do you? I tend to use most of the time music for catalogs, yes, for production music. Uh, I kind of turned away like two years ago from focusing so much on trailer music because the industry has changed very much in the last three to four years um, and concentrate more on TV and working with uh, different uh, publishers to, to do specific albums for TV, like uh, done two albums with killer tracks for tension underscores and things like that. Oh. And, um, also got into film scoring during the time you just happen to to get to know people over time and uh, yeah, get into film scoring and and uh also just this year did my first actual game score for for a virtual reality game for sony and uh so yeah it's just uh, a question of diversifying so i'm not only concentrating on production music but i would say that production music and writing albums for different publishers not specifically to picture but for their catalogs is like 70 percent of what i do Okay. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. So tell, tell us a little bit about what, like, what would your ideal thing project be? Are you wanting to go for bigger film or, or more trailers or video games or what would you love to be doing? Um, so the video game thing was a pretty great experience, but it's not always just the question of the project, but also the question of the people you work with. So the CEO of the, of the game company uh, became a friend over time. So he was just it kind of really think alike and uh, could be my brother from another mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was just a great working relationship. And uh, he is a musician as well. Actually, he wanted to do the score for the game himself, but he just didn't have the time, which can be a curse, but can also be a blessing. Uh, communication is easier when you have someone who understands the terms of music, uh, but also obviously you need to convince them that you actually write and not them yeah. uh, but, but that worked out great in the end um i mean obviously i love to do i did three feature films uh i love to do film scoring and writing two picture um but honestly i'm even though i moved to la uh i'm not chasing that right now um but strangely enough opportunities come knocking without me chasing them so i'm just reading a script right now for a feature film that i may be doing in the near future um it all is uh, yeah it, it's people in the end you meet people and and being uh, i get asked a lot, a lot of times is it necessary to be in la to to work as a composer uh i always say it's definitely not necessary in our today's connected world but it is not bad either so right. it definitely helps because you more are more likely to meet people from the same industry yeah Absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually in Phoenix. So it's, but I have to get, fortunately it's only about four or five hours away drive and I can get out there four or five times a year. So that's what I've been doing right now. Um, LA is expensive. Holy cow. That's the downside there. Is, yeah. That's why I'm a little bit outside and not directly in the center. Santa Monica was just no option at all. <laughs> I get asked a lot about strings. Um, and I got into using LA scoring strings probably about seven years ago. And I really have really liked it, but I found that the learning curve on learning how to make strings actually sound real was way harder than I thought. And I was wondering if you could talk about, if you were to give advice on somebody, what kind of software would you go after? How would you approach the learning curve? How do you get strings to sound great? I think that's a very important point there. I don't chase strings to sound real. I chase them to sound good, which is a distinctive uh -huh. difference. So, uh, I mean, I have been lucky enough to work on project where we were able to record live strings. And once you had that, you will never look back when you work with samples. So you just don't get there. But that's pretty much with every other instrument that is out there. You can't... Uh, bring in virtually the human factor that a live recording has. Nevertheless, there are great tools out there that get you very close to the edge. Um, right now, uh, so, so you're asking for what specific libraries uh, I would 
recommend or that I'm using or what's the question there? Yeah. So, so oh. well, well, I mean, how to make them sound great. There's tons of stuff out there in terms of mixing. I just recently uh, did this uh, mixing course from Joel Dolly on the, uh, I think he's selling that on his own now on the Teachable website. And this mixing course I learned more than the last eight years, to be honest. So this is really a good one. Oh, wow. Um, what's, what's it called? I'm going to drop that down. Real quick. Uh, it's, I can, can I post a link here? I can send it to you and at least you can post it. Yeah, I'll post it to the class. Um, I sent the link to you. Give me a second. Um, yeah. pop, pop, pop. So it's not on the cheap side. I think it's 300 bucks, but you can do like three, uh, monthly payments of 99 if you want to use it. Uh, I can, absolutely and wholeheartedly recommend this course. It's been the best thing that happened to me in my time being as a composer. So uh, really, really awesome. good stuff. Sometimes a little bit hard to follow because he's French, so the accent might be an issue at some points. Sometimes you gotta to listen twice what he's actually sure. saying, but well, it doesn't matter. In the end, you can follow along. And he's working in Fruity Loops with kind of uh, kicked me off in the first place. But, um, uh, it doesn't matter in the end which DAW is using because the tools are pretty much the same throughout. So it's and just great to follow along. It's very focused on trailer music, but you get a lot of info for orchestral music in general and for treating strings. And uh, especially he, I think that's a free one he has on his YouTube channel as well, uh, handling low end in strings and brass. And he has a kind of a trick doing multi band compression just on the low end to keep it tight. And, awesome it oh wow I, okay. I can't look back there so it sounds amazing wow um but in terms of libraries to name yeah. what i work uh, work mostly with right now is uh the cinemat cinematic studio strings uh, strings series uh so cinematic cin and and they they released the solo strings and the brass and uh they work fantastically together uh as an australian developer and if I don't use these for, for if I really need upfront stuff, the music sampling strings are great. The adventure strings and the trailer strings. Uh, these are, and uh, the Orchestral Tools Metropolis Arc series. This is pretty much my favorites right now. Oh. I do have some, I, I mean, I have tons of libraries. Uh, I also have uh, LA scoring strings and sometimes I return to them to the shorts for their bite. Mm. Um, a lot of times it's layering, like getting the best out of everything you have mm -hmm. and, and trying to shape your own sound with it. Um, for brass, what do you use for or orchestral brass? Um, as I've said, Cinematic Studio Brass was recently released and uh, found a way into my template. Um, Again, music is sampling. The, the adventure brass and trailer brass, they like legato and all that stuff, although I think that legato is overrated anyway for brass, but they're extremely playable. So you just load up a patch and can pretty much play any line you can imagine with shorts and notes combined, uh, shorts and longs combined. Did you uh, say adventure and what? Trailer brass. Invent adventure and trailer brass. I've never heard yeah, of it. Yeah, so the company is musical sampling. They have uh, they started off two years ago with soaring strings, which is kind oh, of yeah. this John Williams yeah, heavy like vibrato that. soaring uh, sound. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have two packages with uh, adventure strings and adventure brass, and the other one is trailer strings and trailer brass. Okay. So this is, uh, these are great to, um, yeah, just if, if you need the oomph. What about, um, um, what is it, Cinebrass and Cinestrings? Do you I do have uh, the whole Cinebrass line, uh, Cinesampled's line with uh, strings mm. and brass. Yeah. Um, but over time, I tend to use them less and less. I have a full... What I like about the approach is the same with orchestral tools or Spitfire. Uh, I love having an orchestra all recorded in the same room. So like the orchestral tool series uh, recorded at Teldex, the um, cine sample series recorded at the Sony stage and Spitfire obviously recorded at Air or the new studio series if you prefer drier sound. Um, so sometimes this, when, I, uh, when I do 
film scoring, for example, sometimes the Spitfire sound is just not the right one. The, the air, the, the wet sound, and the Sony sound from Cine samples works better. So mm. over time, first, I grew my library of sounds. And uh, also, since I've been working with a bunch of developers, I had been lucky enough to get a lot of stuff for demos and, and doing reviews and things like that. So. Uh, you can get broke by my example libraries, and once you get really into it, um, there's no stopping. So <laughs> I kind of forced myself like one and a half years ago to actually stop chasing for every new sound. Luckily enough, uh, enough with my YouTube channel, I get a lot of stuff for reviews and showcasing it, so I don't need to pay for it, which is nice. But on the other hand, uh, every now and then I just need to add to fries and get a new SSD to <laughs> just make it all. Um, one thing uh, that I forgot to mention in regards to strings and also brass, uh, what I really fall in, fell in love with is uh, the Audio Imperia Jaeger. What, That's a great, so? great package. Audio Imperia is uh, pretty much known for actually sound design. And like two years ago, they hit out of the blue, the market with a full orchestral library, uh, Jaeger, J-A-E-G-E-R. Okay, I'll look it up. Um, which is a balls to the wall trailer orchestral package, pretty much. So you got all the different uh, ensembles. Uh, they like violin too, but you have violin, viola, cello, basses, uh, the full brass section, sound design, percussion, and it just sounds amazing. Really? Okay. Wow, a lot of there's a lot of change in this area. I don't do much um, orchestration and, and cinematic stuff at all. I've just always kind of dabbled with it a little bit. And um, are you we live in good times? There's a lot of stuff out there, and there uh, is. technology has evolved to a point. As I've said, you will never replace the human element that an actual live recording gives you, but mm -hmm. uh, we are getting close. Yeah. So when you say, hey, I don't necessarily go after trying to sound real. I go after trying to sound good. What constitutes good for you? That's a tough question. <laughs> Ask a writer when a script is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, when I listen to it the next morning and I still feel good about it, <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that's it. Okay. So oftentimes you work till late in the night and the next morning you think, what the hell did I do there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, okay. But when you play it and you think, well, yeah, that works. Yeah. Uh, it, it's hard to describe. You can't really put into word what defines good. You just feel good about it. But it is the same as asking somebody how the actual creative process works. Why do you take that? guitar chord there why do you choose this drum fill there or whatever mm. uh it just feels right there yeah. okay okay good and you're working in cubase right are you still i do work in cubase yes is that still your only DAW, or do you kind of multi uh, i mean obviously over time you meander around and try all the stuff that is out there. i have always been a pc guy so logic was never an option for me although i Lately, got me at least a MacBook Pro to be able to, when a client sends over a logic file, to at least open it up and transfer it to Cubase. Um, I dabbled around a little bit with Ableton, uh, checked out Studio One. Mm -hmm. uh, Studio One was for, for a short time rather my go to than Cubase, but I quickly, when Cubase uh, did their nine update, Cubase nine, uh, like two years ago, I think it was. Uh, they kind of uh, stepped up their game and um, I always tend to go back. I think it's just what you grow up with and what you're used to. So yeah. I, I just can, can uh, use Cubase blindly, you know, so there's, I know every corner of it. And yeah. uh, so you just stick to what you know. I noticed in your Instagram, you have a stream deck. I just bought it yesterday, actually. And Did you? I'm just setting it up for, for use with QAs. And it's actually fun to do these photo structures. And uh, it's a different workflow. Be before that, I used my iPad with Touch OC and had all the controls on there. Mm. Um, but I like this uh, hardware feel of the actual mm -hmm. button to touch, you know. So um, I'm still uh, setting it up right now. And cool. uh, you can see it. Actually, let me, can I switch? 
for those who don't know, um, I don't really know much about them, but it's a way of uh, it's physical buttons you can have that you can make control all kinds of things. Your lighting in your room, it could be your DAW, it could be all kinds of different stuff. Exactly. I can show that. That's the thing. And you can set up your own buttons and folder structures. And so I have the buttons for my MIDI controls and things like that. So everything that I usually do with a, a computer keyboard. And right now at the moment, I'm still faster on my computer keyboard than on, on the Stream Deck. As I've said, it's just here for one day. But I can see it working beautiful in the future once you, uh, once I've set it up to the way my workflow is and then when you actually know where the buttons are. So you don't need to read every button, but you can pretty much uh, trigger it without looking at it. Love it. Let's talk about um, Assassin's Creed. Did you do something for them? I did, uh, not specifically to picture. I did, I think one, one trailer queue of mine was licensed for this okay. campaign. Okay. I'm just a big fan of that game series. And so I saw that on your site. I'm like, oh my God, I got to ask him. <laughs> yeah, I know that was uh, was nothing that I did specifically to picture. It was um, yeah, a trailer track that I did for those brains, and they licensed it to to the trailer campaign. Love it, Assassin's Creed. So awesome. nothing too much that I have to do with the game itself. So you you said the a little while ago that you um, worked on a game, like you a, a you did the scoring for a game. What is that like to? I've heard that um, challenge. Definitely not the not the same as you would imagine with a real game where you have adaptive music because this was a virtual reality game and it's more like a film score than an actual game score because oh. the storyline is pretty linear and uh, it has an open world to feel to it and there are moments where you actually adapt the music to what the player is doing like when he's just staying around you obviously have the background loop repeating and not stopping uh -huh. uh, but it's overall it's not as a in a classical game where you where you really uh, work with f mod or wise to integrate music depending on the behavior of the player right so it's really more like a film score like straight 60 minutes or 70 minutes of music cool. uh, and these cues get placed depending on the scene that the player is uh, not working in is uh, yeah experiencing but uh, it's different in that regard that it was a virtual reality game so this immersive thing and um, I tried it actually out the first time mm -hmm. uh, when when I was uh, at their studios in Hannover and uh, yeah I mean it's it's amazing uh, it's I think the whole technology thing is still in its children's shoes it's not ready uh, it's ready but it's i think there's a lot of room to, for improvement and, and wow. potential uh but it was hell a lot of fun to to have a little bit of budget for live recordings we did a string quartet on top of the orchestra score and mixed wow. that and we had a great mixing engineer in the studio there and then over uh, was a great experience overall and really fun to do and i'm I, honestly i'm proud of how it turned out Sounds really? what was the name of that uh, you... it's eden tomorrow Eden tomorrow. Okay. And it's a VR game for um, Sony or Xbox it's or Sony PlayStation VR exclusive for the time being. So it's only if you have a Sony PlayStation VR, then you uh, are able to play it. Uh, reviews coming in right now. So it looks like people are pretty happy about it. I mean, the story is great. I love it when, when game is, it's not a shooter. By okay. no means. It's really more more like an adventure exploring game. You're on a foreign planet and you have no idea who you are. You just have a little robot that uh, named Newton that <laughs> explains a little bit uh, what you are going to do. So and by but and you can switch with them. So you can run around as a human and you can switch to the robot and then you can fly around. So that's pretty cool. Love uh, it. I gotta check that out. I used to be a big player of those uh, Mist games. You remember Mist? Yeah, I remember that. It's kind of the same, you know, walking around on an island and solving puzzles and stuff. So yeah, pretty much the same, just that you can look all around and you are just immersed oh, wow. in, in the experience. Um, Do you work so, with singers much? Sorry, I interrupted you. No, sorry, I didn't get your question. Oh, do you work with uh, singers very often? Um, 
as often as I can actually, and when the project actually calls for it. So for the for pretty much all the film scores that I've done, I had singers on board. I did my solo album in 2017, Elements for Those Brains, where I had a lot of singers. Uh, that was kind of a special project because it was not really to a brief. It was to, I wanted to go back to writing music for the sake of just writing music and okay. write something that I feel good about and not to client brief or whatever, just whatever creatively comes out and a lot of that was based on vocal performances and, and getting singers on board so that was one of the main goals I had in mind to to work with a bunch of singers especially singers that are well known in the trailer community like Marita Saltwood who's singing with uh, Two Stops From Hell and uh, Uyanga Bolt I love her voice she's one of my favorite singers ever uh, Julie Elvin who did uh, the what was the name of the game mm forgot about one of the biggest titles of 2018 where she was pretty much the main vocal artist mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it's I love working with singers either in the studio here or even remotely uh, especially when you kind of just tell them do what you feel right uh, about uh, just just go with the flow and when you get capable performers to, to work with, that's really the fun part. Oh, cool. When they get back to you with the stuff that you didn't even think about or expect yeah. because they just feel it. Um, what, now when you record singers yourself, uh, can you give us an idea of what kind of mics and interfaces and stuff that, you're, that you use? Um, pretty much straight into, so I have an RME uh, Babyface Pro uh, audio interface. Okay. Uh, which has pretty nice converters and, and preamps, so that sounds good in itself. I don't need any specific mic preamp or whatever. I just plug my mic and Actually, I just have a, it's a Roland D80, let me check. It's a Roland DR80C, but actually that's kind of a rebrand. It's an AKG, actually. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's not the high-end mic you would say it's just uh no i just got me some some road nt5 stereo mic pairs to record some some guitars and stuff like that um and they sound great uh, as well um other than that i just try to get a clean signal with as little as possible noise floor so the rme is great for that uh and all the rest is e rather done in post-processing. I rather keep the freedom to, to tweak it later on to whatever I want instead of running it through a signal chain beforehand and not be able to change anything afterwards. <laughs> Do you use sample libraries in like Splice or um, anything like that? Or I actually have a Splice subscription. I started the, haven't even utilized it yet to the full extent that I should. <laughs> um, I have, Long time, I've been a long time user of a lot of stuff from the Big Fish audio libraries. Yep. Um, although I have to be honest, I'm not the guy that actually takes the construction kits, uh, jumps them together and say, I've got a song. That's, in my opinion, not the approach that should be done there. But uh, if you, for example, take a drum loop that just sounds amazing in itself and, and build a track based on that, uh, or even a guitar loop or whatever they have, um, so they have a great production quality and what I, uh, I learned a lot by actually since you get these stems of these tracks of these construction kits you can actually listen to all the elements so that's great for deconstructing a mix and seeing how it's actually done and how how the guitars bass drums and whatever they have in instruments uh, work together so it's, yeah. it's really uh, a very good uh, way of uh, coming from the other way around. So having the final product and seeing, okay, how it's done, how the guitars sound on their own, why do they work in the mix the way they work and things like that. So that, that's helped me a lot uh, over the years to, to delve, dive into different genres that I have not been comfortable with. So I, that's for cool. example, for the reality stuff, I got asked to do a lot of uh, hip hop based tension tracks and things like that. And I've never been into that kind of music. And I still don't, I'm not a fan of, of hip hop rap music overall. Uh, I mean, every genre has its kind of highlights that stick out where you just say, wow, that's a brilliant track or whatever. Um, 
but I've never been too too familiar with it. But these kind of construction kits help to see how it's actually done and how you can get the sound. That's cool. I have been, it to sound good. In the I'm a big fan of Smack by Big Fish Audio. I use that. Yeah, a, that's a great and library. And stuff. Um, what it would be a go like um, if you had to take one piece of equipment from your room or just a couple pieces. Or or plugins. What's your what's your desert island plugin? Like the thing you can't live without. Uh, that would be the. That's tough. Uh, but if I really would not need to nail it down, it would be the Fab Filter suit. Really? Okay. Why? So the Fab Filter Pro Q is pretty much on every channel I have, um, and. That's the main one. Their compressor is great as well. Although there, I would argue maybe some of the Waves stuff comes in. The CLA, uh, CLA series from Waves is great. I just got me the Shops Omni Channel, which is a great plugin kind of channel strip with all in one. Um, Shops Omni Channel? Uh, Shops, the mix engineer, mm. Andrew oh, Shops. Okay. And for Waves, he did the Shops Omni Channel. That's a, hmm. I think they released it like half a year ago, something like that. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, Desert Island uh, plugins, Fab Filter, Desert Island Instrument would be pretty much, I guess, my, uh, my Variax, which gives me 20 guitars in one, and, <laughs> uh, and Omnisphere. I was going to ask you about Omnisphere. I'm a big fan of theirs. Yeah, it's, it's, if, I mean, over time, you collect tons of synth and stuff like that. Even got me a Behringer 12D DeepMind uh, hardware synth to actually have some knobs to fiddle around with. Okay. And it's not the same investment as, as a MOOC or something of the bigger stuff. Yeah. Um, a question I missed there, what's your top plug top plug in? For me, it's the Fab Filter series, especially the Fab Filter Pro Q, the EQ, and also the compressor, the limiter. The multiband uh, compressor is awesome. Mm. Um, sorry, there, it's sorry. Just to, just to make sure I heard correctly, Fab Filter. Yeah, F A B. Filter. Okay, okay, Fab Filter. Okay, great. Thank That's you. Company. Oh, one yeah. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, you you collect tons of synth and stuff like that, but uh, Omnisphere is definitely the desert island synth. I think never in my lifetime I will get through all the uh, patches and sounds that are actually in there given the fact that you can also record your own stuff and uh, create soundscape that haven't been there before. So, but even yeah. with their, like, what is it? 80 gigabyte library or 120 or something like that, where they pack all their former releases and sample libraries in there. Uh, it's just, it's in desert, it's a desert island synth, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I love Omnisphere. Uh, did you go to NAMM this year? I was actually, okay. and I needed a week vacation afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the noise floor is just killing me every right. time I'm there. But well, um, it was great. It was, was uh, really nice. Yeah. I saw that you had a picture of uh, Alan Meyerson. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. Yeah. Very humble, very friendly. And uh, I, yeah. I had a connection a few years ago, and I got to actually go into Hans Zimmer's studio and got to meet him and just hang out. And they were mixing us. Uh, I got to watch them mix a score. It was for some Tom Cruise movie at the time. I can't remember what it was. It was Edge of Tomorrow, I think. It was something like that. Uh -huh. But it hadn't been released yet. I was watching. It was just the coolest experience just to be I can there. imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, that's You've awesome. You've got this, the score of Gladiator on the wall with, you know, everybody's hand, you know, signatures on it. And, and mm -hmm. it, it was just surreal. I don't get to see that kind of stuff very often. So it was cool. Yeah. Even when you're in LA, you don't get to see that that often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you're invited or again going over to the studio or something like that. Yeah, that is very cool. Do you have any people that you would like that, like who are your heroes in this business? Who are people that you're like that guy motivates me whenever I hear his stuff? Um, I mean, being a German myself, obviously the way Hans Zimmer has paved his way through the industry and into this industry is a. Uh, big inspiration obviously although i have to admit that i don't think that i would work at remote control mm. just because um i think that's good if you're starting out and if you want to find your way into there but um 
and I'm amazed by what they do, but the business side of things and, and I know composers that work at Bleeding Fingers. I mean, that company doesn't have this name for no reason at all. <laughs> There's a reason why it's called Bleeding Fingers. They work their ass out there. It's, yeah. it's totally cool. And, and uh, I know people love it. And it's a big career push, obviously, or can be. I mean, there's a lot of people who go there and fall through the net, so to say. So they won't get a career push out of that. It's very exhaustive, and um, but nevertheless, uh, overall through his career, he has defined sounds. He has defined whole genres. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he has an amazing sense for for melody and simplicity in scores. Yes, for for the most of it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that I will uh, earn a bad reputation for that. I've never been a big fan of John Williams. Mm. To be honest, uh, I mean, obviously the ET theme is great. I love the the um, Jurassic Park theme. These are amazing melodies. Mm. Uh, so he's definitely a brilliant writer. But overall, I've never been too attached to this kind of classical writing of orchestral music, and uh, even the Star Wars score, as iconic as it is, and it works in the film. But even in the film, I'm not too attached to it. It's just I think it's just a matter of taste. So I'm. Yeah, the Hans Zimmer will be definitely on top of the list. Uh, I also love uh, Ramin Javadi, who actually the Zimmer school, so to say, uh, working at remote control with his, his scores for Game of Thrones and thing, things like that. Um, and non-remote control related, I'm a big fan of uh, everything horror scores. Uh, and uh, there was, I forgot the name, I would need to look up my Spotify playlist, this uh, Spanish composer who did, uh, I think the score for Mama uh, was it. That's, mm. uh, I would need to look up the name, just, okay. just amazing. I love this kind of, um, Out of the utilization box. Of, of strings, for example, in a, in a very disharmonic manner, doing all these scratching and screeching noises and just getting you in. <laughs> the edge of your seat yeah. or, uh, especially in, co in uh combined with the visuals then so i love that david what about uh bear mccreary do you ever follow his stuff with walking dead uh, definitely i mean he's he's amazing i what i really loved i saw a video of him explaining the da vinci score where he had this kind of uh, going backwards and forwards the same melody that's all that video like, that was just mind blowing. The score to that. I love. I love his score for for um, uh, Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Uh, even though the series kind of lost me at season five or something like that, but uh, the score <laughs> was was always top notch. I love the yep. intro theme. Uh, it's yeah, it's it's just great. So so he's a great composer as well. He really his work on Battlestar Galactica with all the Tycos and everything just. I fell in love with Asian drums because of his stuff. And I had yeah. never heard anything like that. Yeah. It was just the way he made it so musical was just amazing to me. And he's not real big on melody. It's more of, I mean, from my perspective, it's more just about a feeling and a texture and a, Oh my God. He's just, he it really, by the way, I should mention, uh, closely follow with Hans Zimmer and Ramin Jabadi, uh, definitely on the same side of things because he just has a unique style and unique rhythm mainly as uh, Brian Tyler. Oh, so okay. I just love his stuff. If you listen to uh, Now You See Me, the main theme is the the seven i think seven eighth is it the the rhythm stuff and also for for fast and furious he did a video where he i think for fast and furious five or something like that where he's in the studio playing drums and guitar and all this stuff on his own wow. i mean he's an amazing multi-instrumentalist and uh it's kind of out of this world guy and the music is, is great as well so. so i'll have to check them him out how do you keep up with all these different composers and what they're doing they just kind of when it comes to you, or do you have some way in which you actively follow these? Um, I think it just stumbles upon my Facebook feed pretty much when you see something. I just yesterday, uh, that's why I was thinking of Brent Taylor, because just yesterday he released a video of him uh, doing a more yeah, band approach on, on scoring, like electric piano, bass, guitar, drums, uh, but sounds amazing. And uh, 
just great. Um, yeah, I don't actively look up unless I read something in the news or read something on Facebook about it, and then you just follow the link and uh, look it up. Yeah. So yeah. no active routine of following things uh, intentionally unless I'm interested in something or want to want to know something. But other than that, it just yeah happens to pop up in the Facebook sure. uh, stream and then you follow it. Does anybody have any questions? I, I want to make sure I give room for anybody that wants to, to ask a question. Just unmute. Yeah, sure. Shoot. <laughs> Hi. Hi. It's Chris here. Hi, Dirk. Um, I was curious about your, I, you said, um, so your video game experience um, was relatively a new thing for you. You were, that wasn't really what you've been focusing on. How did you find working on the video game? How did I? Because you did VR and then job? video games. How, how did I get into the job or how did I find working on, on a video game? Uh, yeah, on the video game and maybe how it's different than some of your other experiences writing for um, video games. As, as, as I've mentioned before, it's not the, 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 the experience that I have there might have been a little bit different from what a usual composer for video games will tell you because um, since it was a game for virtual reality, the approach is a bit different than with classical games like Diablo or any PC or uh, platform games uh, that have adaptive music. So that was more like film scoring than game scoring. Um, nevertheless, um, I think that game scoring and film scoring is kind of uh, getting closer together. I mean, game scoring has more budget even than the film industry, meanwhile, for, for music. So um, they they kind of took over the role or they they value music more than it was in the past with uh, 8 bit music pretty much because the tools are just there and uh, if if you listen to to scores like skyrim and things like that where you just got this massive epic orchestral settings with live orchestra and all that stuff i mean the budget is there so experience wise for me it was just great because the director was or the, the CEO of the game company was a musician as well and had some ideas and we were shooting back and forth uh, with uh, the initial theme development and uh, it was easy communication with him because he was a musician as, as well so that that was easy I had other uh, instances working on a film score for example where the director had no idea of music at all but then it helps to talk about feelings and what they actually want to express with a certain scene and so with the game score it was not that much based on adaptive music and doing music depending on the actions of the, uh, on the actions of a player but more a linear storyline where we have just different themes and motives and uh, mood setters so to say uh, to to immerse the player in the game. Hope that helps. Great question. Um, I, I'm going to just, let's do a shootout here. I'm going to, in the last few minutes here, I'm going to name some things. Just give me one word or one sentence, the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. Kick drum. <laughs> uh, um, oomph. <laughs> well, uh, in in EDM productions, uh, that's a lifelong search for the perfect one, right? Um, so you ca you can make a science out of it. I do just uh, when when I do, uh, for example, TV scores where you're. I, so I did write some EDM stuff in in my days as well, and uh, but and I saw. Sorry, that is not just one word, but <laughs> um, I saw this announcement from, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the masterclass from uh, that Holland guy, Netherlands. Guy. Oh, um, dead, dead Mouse? Or, um... Not Dead Mouse, the other one, uh, Armin van Buren. Oh, okay, yeah. Armin van Buren. I saw his announcement. Uh, about the kick drum and the lifelong search and the, you learn the hard way when the crowd doesn't react to, to the kick drum you chose, you know. So uh, <laughs> I've never been that much of a scientific guy at that point. So I'm just searching through the samples I have and take the first one that I actually feel matches and throw it in and done. So um, 
but yeah, kick drum can be tricky uh, depending on the style, obviously. Definitely. Um, a reality TV. Uh, although I don't watch it for my entertainment purposes, I really watch it, to be honest, I watch a lot, unfortunately, oh, cool. <laughs> due to research and see, okay, what, what editors use right now. Uh, reality is not my favorite format of entertainment, but it helps pay the bills. Cool. Okay. Electric guitars. Uh, love it. Uh, uh oh, I think we lost you dirt. Do you guys uh, still see him? Oh, there you uh, are. There was a call coming in. Sorry. Oh. Um, uh, so I can't play as good as I would like to in my head, but I love it. <laughs> I love the versatility of it. Uh, I love to take out my Evo and just create some soundscapes with some floating notes. Yeah. How do you record electric? Uh, pretty much straight into my interface and then everything amping is done inside the box. Really? Can you give us a plug-in that you'd recommend for amping? Uh, favorite guitar amp plug-in? Well, actually there's four to be honest. One that is my go-to for everything clean and uh, dreamy and all that stuff is uh, Scafham amp. You're going to have to spell that. <laughs> I sent you the link. Okay, that's great. It's actually part of the Slate bundle. Okay. Scuffum S gear. So I sent you the link. That's my favorite for everything clean and light crunch. Uh -huh. um, and for if I really need to go the heavier route, uh, it will be the Joe Sturgis Tones plugins, JST. And they have three different, uh, I think, meanwhile, four. Uh, amp models. And if that doesn't work, I actually do love the Waves PRS plugins as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. This is really helpful. I'm not a big guitarist myself, but a lot of students are. You know, they, there's some incredible guitarists in this class and other classes that I, I help uh, support. Um, oops, did I just repost that? I'm just copying it into the chat here. Yeah, sure. I'm just sending the uh, link to the PRS plugins as well. By the way, if they're, um, I'm always looking for their guitarists or whatever other instrumentalists out there. I'm always looking for collaborators for cues. So when, when I get briefs for um, guitar-based stuff or something like that, sometimes it's just faster to uh, have someone play it in than me fiddling around for hours and trying to come oh, up with something sure. decent. Yeah. Yeah, so, my my um my uh, sound uh, my songwriting buddy is a killer guitarist. <laughs> okay, but most importantly, he creates stuff, which is interesting. Because it's one thing to play really well, but it's another thing to just come up with. I don't know where he comes up with these things, but all these riffs and crazy stuff. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. I think so I'm definitely going to tell him about you. Folk on their own, definitely. <laughs> um, hey, Dirk. What's the fuck? Uh, uh -huh. a question. Okay, yeah, we could actually speak in German, but uh, I think it would be Let, Let's keep it in English for the other ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, I'm Tobias, um, calling in from Berlin, and um, Hi, I just heard you mention that uh, you you're always open for collaboration and you know instrumentalists. What yeah. would be the best way for you to send you submit you something that you can check out and for a possible? Uh, ideally, just email. So it's uh, my name Dirk Elert dot composer at gmail dot com. Okay. D I R K E A. And it's Maybe via your you website can, too, I guess. You can so. just uh, post the email address again. So if you want to get in touch, okay, cool. feel free to get in touch there. And what do you usually look for? Uh, or what, what are the uh, type of collaborations, collaborators that you're usually looking for, Dirk? Uh, yeah, as I've said, guitarist is one, one big demand uh, when, when I do stuff that I just can't handle on my own. Uh, so I'm just not a good guitarist. I'm more of the bonfire guitarist. And uh, for some rhythm stuff in the background of a track, it works great. Uh, or as I've said, some Evo style ambient stuff on top. Uh, when it comes to intricate lines or just a good solo or something like that, I just drop dead, <laughs> fall, <laughs> fall off the grid there. <laughs> and, um, 
I oftentimes look for uh, collaborators with uh, stringed instruments, like a cellist, violinist, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a Celtic-themed album like two years ago under under an alias Karatakus, uh, where I collaborated with a with a world woodwind player uh, who did a ton of woodwinds on that album. That was great. So I actually tend to do a second album for that one. So I might be soon looking for someone to be playing woodwinds. Um, but other than that, I mean, if, if you feel you, you have an instrument, even, I mean, a friend of mine is, is doing contrabass. So yeah. that's not the usual solo instrument, but he does stuff on that that you would never think of. Another friend of mine actually builds his own instruments. He has kind of thing called whale drum, which is just a plywood uh, body with, with a string attached that you can actually bend. And he got a pick up on that and runs it through amp. It just sounds crazy, sounds you've never heard before. And uh, so, yeah, creativity has no limits there. I'd imagine as a composer, you're really always interested in looking for those sort of otherworldly sounds, right? To give. You definitely want to find something that nobody else had before. Okay. You hear that, guys? If you come up with something. <laughs> but it's like writing the next uh, chart breaker where you want to write something that hasn't been there before and never heard and everybody loves it. I mean, it's uh, the chase for the Holy Grail. Uh, yeah. I think there are just a few ones who are lucky enough to find it. Yeah. John wants to ask you a question. Go ahead, John. I'll I'll unmute you here. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, just two questions. One is, what music do you listen to when you relax? And the second is, um, do you notice a difference between scored music in European films uh, as opposed to American films? Uh, first question is easy to answer. Uh... Usually, I listen to news radio, something like that, where there's not much music running when I'm in the car or something. Uh, the thing is, when you do music all day, uh, morning to evening, uh, it's hard for me to just enjoy music. When I listen to music, my mind always starts analyzing. So how it's done, what, why are the strings doing what they do, what is the bass line playing and things like that. I think that's... Uh, the dark side of the metal, so to say, <laughs> <laughs> working. But that's like with every under, other industry or any other professional. The field that you're working in is the one where your mind... It, it, I can enjoy movies. So when I go to the theater and I try to not concentrate too much on the, to, on, on the film score, but just enjoy the film. So that works. But listening to music itself, per se, as a relaxation, uh, pretty much relaxation music would be the ideal answer there. <laughs> like like having something meditative or something like that where that doesn't distract the mind too much. That would be good for for uh, calming. Um, but other than that, yeah, listening to music, I mean, I can enjoy music still. Uh, and I personally prefer the, the uh, harder side of things, like a little bit metal and a good, good amount of guitars and drums and even some screaming vocals every now and then. I don't mind that. Um, Typical German. <laughs> yeah, I want to throw in Ramstein here. So. <laughs> but um, no, actually, it's still got to be melodic. So as I said, I come from the symphonic metal background. So I still I love the new release that uh, Within Temptation did. It's a great modern sounding album. Uh, with a lot of uh, synth and electronic elements, but still a good amount of good old rock. And second question, difference European and uh, American music. Funnily enough, when I started out in 2011, uh, and I moved to LA like nine months ago, so most of the time of my career, I have actually been in Germany. Uh, wait a second, what band? Uh, I mentioned Within Temptation. It's a Dutch symphonic metal band, one of the most favorite bands in Europe in that genre or in the metal genre overall. Um, and they just released a new album called Resist. You can look it up on Spotify um, or even buy it on iTunes or whatever. And uh, back to the question. Uh, when I started out, I tended to work only on the American market. So I pretty much did not any work in Germany or in Europe. 
even though I was there, not in the U.S. But um, overall, um, the American sound tends to be, for lack of better words, bigger or, I hate to say that, more epic. I think the European overall aesthetics for film scoring is more, you could compare that you, if you really kind of bring it down, then I would say US is more the full orchestra with the choir and Europe is more the chamber size orchestra. Mm. Oh, that's a good analogy. I, I like that. Um, man, this has been fantastic. I want to be very respectful of your time. It's been an hour and we've picked your brain. I, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Does anybody have any final? We have like ten minutes more for some question if there are. Okay. So, if anybody, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Hey, this is Amber. Hi. Um, so back when you're talking about using the strings and making them sound real or good, do you ever use any hardware that kind of manipulates the sounds to like finish off the tremolos, or do you just stick to the samples? Um. So. The only hardware that I use is so I'm I'm a big believer that you need some kind of um, performance even when working with samples. So uh, I mean I know a lot of composers or, or producers that kind of write with a mouse and do do the notes in the note and things like that. So I actually like to play in the stuff. That's the first thing, and I try not to hard quantize everything to the grid. So I try to keep some sort of performance with the playing. That's one thing, and also um, I heavy usage of mod wheel and expression. So so riding the wheels for for dynamic performances and arcs throughout a performance is, in my opinion, what differentiates uh, having a even a sample based more or less performance instead of just really a programmed um, interpretation of, 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 of music or of, of a melody. Yeah. So helpful, in, yeah. I don't use any other hardware there, just, just mod wheel expression and some whatever you have available for, for MIDI controllers. You can, I, for, for a certain time, I used my iPad with an XY pad where I had mod wheel on, on the Y and uh, expression on the X axis. And then when you move it around, you can really do nice uh, expression dynamic movements given the library oh. reacts to these controllers. Gotcha. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Great question. What would you give advice for any newbies trying to get into kind of following the composer film and trailer and, and video game composer world? Yeah, the obvious question that <laughs> always gets asked towards the end. What would you tell new composers? You'd say run away. Uh, yeah, yeah, do, do something that actually gets you <laughs> some money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, no, uh, if you are passionate about doing it, I say do it because there's nothing better than following your dreams and uh, following your passion. And if you're good at your passion, there will always be a way to, or you will always find a way. It might be a bumpy road. No, it might be, it will be a bumpy road. But uh, I think even nowadays still quality counts. And uh, the only thing that you need to be aware of when you set foot into this lion's den and put yourself out there, Make sure that you have practiced enough to bring your skills up to par with what's out there. So when you get in touch with publishers and send them your stuff, you definitely don't want to send stuff that either sounds worse than what they have or just plain sounds bad. So you want to make sure it sounds at least as good as what they have, if not even better. Um, uh, so I'm not talking about compositional skills there. I think the role of a composer has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years. So you're not just the writer of the music anymore. You are a producer, you are a technician, you uh, are the mixer, you are every person in one, producer, mixer, writer, engineer, uh, performer for instruments maybe that you do the guitar parts, or you have people coming over and, and record something for you. But uh, you need to step up the game on a bunch of different aspects of music production, not only on writing. 
that's the most important thing there. Yeah. But on the other hand, we have nowadays the technology to make that possible. So, mm -hmm. and the uh, playing field barrier to to get into the field is way lower than it was twenty years ago. Twenty years ago, you still needed a big studio to actually do the production that you can now do on a MacBook Pro mm -hmm. or on whatever kind of uh, laptop or PC. And yeah. uh, obviously, you need some starting investment but you can roll pretty soon and you just need to learn the tools that you have at hand love it well is there anything you want to plug before we leave can we follow you on twitter and things like that um i mean if you're interested in more i run a youtube channel uh, i can leave the link here which uh, where i do reviews of sample libraries composing live streams uh, streams and um yeah just some general dubbing. And by the way, I changed the game a little bit. That's why I was at NAMM show. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thanks for posting the link. Yeah. <laughs> We're faster than me. Um, <laughs> Got it I up actually do, do a lot of, uh, so I try to have a weekly stream where I present a new sample library or something like that and actually work together with the developers now to actually do a giveaway. So usually we, uh, someone can win the actual library that we are showcasing. So if you want to join the live streams, usually they are on Friday mornings, 10 a.m. PST. Okay. Uh, they last everything between one and four hours. <laughs> 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 and um, <laughs> I try to keep it brief. So, I mean, a lot of people complain that it's uh, just really long. Yes, but I'm writing life, so so it's really just just a fly on the wall thing, uh, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, like with every creative endeavor, sometimes you sit down and say, "Today I write that song that's gonna make it," and after the eight-hour session, you realize, "Okay, today was not the day." <laughs> well, <laughs> that happens to all of us. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, follow there and uh, Twitter is twitter.com slash d e t u n e d e d t u n d e. So the same as uh, uh, YouTube, pretty much. Okay. And the obvious uh, Facebook thingy. Okay. Very cool. Well, there's links on your website too, right? For all that. Yeah, exactly. Or www.detune.de. Okay. Detune DE. All right. Cool. Exactly. Man, this has been so good. Thank you, Derek. This is. Thanks for having me. Man. My pleasure. Um, can, the last question is uh, can we invite you back sometime? Yeah, of course. If you schedule mean? allows, sure. <laughs> What's that? I said if schedule allows, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, man. This is absolutely a pleasure. It's good to see you finally in person. Thank you for being an inspiration to us. Let me know when you're in LA, then we can grab the pin. <laughs> okay. I'd like that. <laughs> Talk to you later, man. Okay, guys. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.